Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Game of Thrones podcast. I am your host, Carmine of Red Team Review, and I'm joined here once again by the new Night King himself, Brett Zagerman. Yeah, I mean, somebody else, ha- somebody has to inherit it, right? His fiefdom. <laughs> like, somebody inherits now all of the land north of the wall that no one, that's completely unpopulated. Pretty much. Oh, that's right. It is yeah. unpopulated. Ooh, we'll talk about that. But uh, Completely and utterly, yeah. Guys, welcome back to another episode of the Thrones Podcast, and today we'll be talking about episode three of season eight called The Long Night. As always, we're available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so consider checking us out on those platforms. And if you do check us out on iTunes, as always, please leave us a review on there because it helps out a lot. And also be sure to leave your thoughts and questions down below in the comments section. We might cover them in the next episode. You just Oof. you just had to say something, didn't you? You just had to fucking make that joke back in season seven about her doing some stupid bullshit maneuver and then killing a White Walker, and then it turns out she kills the White well, Walker. I knew I knew one like the minute she got that <laughs> dagger, I knew one hundred percent that she was gonna kill a White Walker. I I was not sure that she was gonna kill the Night King. I think we'd made some jokes about. We her made doing a mu- a bunch of jokes about it to the point where even people in the comment section, like up to yeah. like episode two, were echoing, "Are oh, gonna kill the White Walker?" Just like Preston said, "No, she kills the White Walker, the number one yeah. guy." I mean, <laughs> we we knew she was gonna kill a White Walker, I, and I think we made some jokes about it being like horrible enough if she killed the the, the Night King with with backflips. The fact that like it did happen, like something happened, like it wasn't a backflip, but it was something as cartoonish and ridiculous, like flying out of freaking nowhere, like flying from the sky. That was actually um, a Ray maneuver. I don't know if you have seen Last Jedi enough, but uh, Ray, when Ray is fighting those uh, Praetorian guards, she one of them has like her by the thing or whatever, and she can't move her sword, so she drops it and slashes it. I see. I see. No, somebody showed me there. There was a bunch of like uh, screen caps of of um, of different video games where the same thing was happening. Like somebody gets caught, their hand caught, and they drop it and they catch it with their other hand. It's apparently not very not very original. But uh, Preston, yeah. we we made a joke. And it came. Stop making jokes. Just stop making jokes, please. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> The thing, uh, the thing is, is like, and people have been asking me, like, do you think George R. R. Martin is gonna do something similar? No. Um, well, obviously, there's no Night King in the book, so we can't, we can't really. There's talk no about Night that, King yet. But, um, but but would he would he have something? Well, there's there's a couple things that like, so so this episode, I think a lot of people have, have are all of a sudden woke to how ridiculously silly. The the, uh, the show has become actually not true. Um, Let me just interject one second. So, yeah. so I do know these two gay guys. They recently started watching, it and they thought the episode was trash. But my buddy, who's been, my buddy uh, firefighter Dave, is what I call him. Uh, he's been watching it since for years now, and he thought the Arya thing was super cool. So even casual people, casual fans of the show, even they're fucking split. The whole fandom, yeah. I feel like, is split in half between people who watch Preston Jacobs videos and people who don't watch Preston <laughs> Jacobs videos. <laughs> I think so. I think people, a couple of people, are, are are angry about two different things. One, there's people that are angry that that. That Arya did something so cartoonish and like fan servicey or wannabe fan servicey, as as like taking down the Night King. I think there's that 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 uh, that we might make fun of, and then there's people that felt it was it was too anticlimactic. And, and that the Night King. There's also people. There's a third group of people who 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 are big fans of prophecy, and they yeah, feel yeah, cheated. Yeah. Yes. And that, and so either like this, you know, had this happened in in the last episode, maybe things would have been different. And then had John been the person doing it, maybe it would have been. I different. want to challenge you on that, but we'll get to that. Um, before we start the whole thing, scale from one to ten. I always ask you every time. Uh, if you want, I can go first. Um, I thought this was a very poor episode, but not for all the reasons we're we're talking about. Yes, everything was super illogical, but um. The episode was way too dark. The cuts were too fast. The the um the characters' progression, like there were jumps around, you know, like Arya's outside, then she's in the then she's in the library, then she's she's at the Night King with no logical progression. I want to I want to defend a bit of that, but go ahead. 
Right. Jorah, Jorah is outside fighting. He all of a sudden senses that Danny needs help and he goes finds her. You know, characters completely disappear. Like Alice Karstark just disappears. <laughs> I um, noticed that too. You know, Bron- Bronze Ran- Bronze on Royce like isn't around at He's all. He's not in the episode at all, but he was in the episode for a preview. Yeah, Bran Bran just does stuff. Bran know, does like, nothing for no reason, right? But but I'm saying like he works for no reason at all, um, and and so it, like even even like dismissing all of, like the really ridiculous like strategy, I'm talking like the personal narratives were jumpy and illogical and didn't go anywhere. Like if I had to take, if I were to take any character like Tyrion, like what am I supposed to know about Tyrion? Like he starts out the episode nervous and then he's angry that he goes down to the crypts and then he s- tries to flirt with Sansa and then he like holds hands with her. Like there's no logical to progression to what this character is doing. He's just, it's random vignettes of, of stuff there's no there, with nothing cohesive. The the closest thing to um, a good story is is Theon. Well, know? once again, we'll get to it. But what would you give the score yeah. from one to ten? Uh I mean, low. I'd give it like a four. And four a and a half. I would give it. Yeah. For what it was, for for the parts that we could see, because I I had to, and I also I before I say this, I'm not promoting piracy, but I had to. I had to download it, and I, because on, on my computer, when I when I download things, I have this uh, player that allows me to increase the brightness. When I could, yeah. when I could see stuff, it was it was pretty solid. For the episode, for what it was, the awful things aside, I would give it a seven, solid seven. It was okay. It was above average from a normal Thrones episode. It was nothing special, which is weird because when I first saw it, I had my fanboy goggles on and I gave it like an eight, a half, maybe a nine. This mm. is why you need to watch something like three times in a row before you fucking review it. I, I went from like yeah. a nine to like a seven. For what it was, it was entertaining. It was enjoyable. People are going really harsh on it, giving it like a three or a four because they're like putting the culmination of all episodes into this one. I'm just going at it for based off my entertainment of this one episode, not the entire yeah. series as a whole, is what everybody's doing because everybody keeps saying, "So this is it. This is the, all, all those years of planning." No, no, not all years of planning. It's not what I'm reviewing. Just if I enjoyed the episode or not. That's my enjoyment. So I would yeah, give it a seven. I, mean, I I actually and I and I'm and I I actually think that the 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 way that it was filmed was very michael bay and i don't and i don't and and i and i say it was very michael bay in the sense that if you take any michael bay scene like frame for frame it's very very beautiful um michael bay can set up very beautiful shots but then it's rapid fire and it's just so much at once it's like one second one second one second two seconds you know and you're just like oh my god um there was some really it wasn't as bad as michael bay but you know, there were some really beautiful shots, um, like when you know when the when the when the trench starts on fire. That's beautiful. Or when the when the when the the um, Dothraki's lights go out go out. That's very eerie. But but when you place them in the context of the whole story, nothing really makes sense. You well, know? it's funny you say that because I wish I'd have sent this this article to you before before we started. So this is something I saw on Reddit while browsing Reddit uh, the other day. I saw this. Game of Thrones cinematographer defends season 8 episode 3 lighting after viewer complaints. I know the episode wasn't too dark because I shot it. Um, And the top comment as far as when I saw it was uh, this one guy, MHKS, he says, An article I read stated a potential culprit is the equipment they were viewing the episode on are such high quality it looked good, but thanks to streaming and imperfect viewing locations slash living rooms, it lost clarity. That makes sense. A couple months ago, I was shopping for a TV. Now, I needed a 32-inch because I like to use a small TV as a kind of a secondary screen for my computer, and uh, I noticed that most 32-inch televisions are fucking awful for a lot of reasons. If you mm. go 40 inches and above, they have all these like amazing technologies like HDR. For those of you who don't know, HDR, I, 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 H, yeah, HDR, that's where you can see in the shadows, clarity in the shadows. But I had people in my comment yeah. section saying, I have a, like a brand new television with HDR and I still couldn't see shit. Right, and even then, you still have to pick the right television for the right stuff. And it's and it's crazy how cuz cuz <laughs> the Lord of the Rings people are making fun of us. Helm's Deep was shot at night and you could see everything at the Helm's Deep battle in the second Lord of the Rings movie, but you can't see shit yeah. here. 
And and I mean, Helm's Deep is a really excellent um, battle scene where where you understand everything that's going mm-hmm. on. You know, there there there's not there's the fast cuts don't ruin things. There's no shaky cam. Like you know, there's no overuse of CGI. Like you can you get all of the 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 action, and it makes sense. It, you know, it, it's all narratively put together really well. Um, recently. Um, Recently, uh, I read an article by by Sean Baby, and he was pointing out how, you know, a, an action scene during um, the new Mad Max movie, and he's just like, you watch it, and everything makes sense. You know what each character is doing, and it all leads to itself, versus like a lot of action movies where it's just face, fist, somebody's on the ground, and you're like, what? Um and so that's why I think a lot of the action scenes were horrible, especially the dragon fighting scenes where it's John's face, it's Danny's face, Danny's face, it's the Night King's face, and you don't really know what's going on. I didn't know what dragon was attacking, which dragon, who was falling to the ground until much later where you're like, oh, John got off that dragon. I guess he's the one that went to the ground, you know? Um, there, were, there was two dragons battling and it was supposed to be John and, and the Night King's dragons. And then they showed Danny's face all of a sudden and you're like, what's going on? It was, it, it, it's an, it was an action episode. I accept that it was an action episode and there were beautiful action episodes. Um, Battle of the Bastards was a beautiful action episode. Um, a Hard Home was a beautiful action episode. And this one was just bad in the sense that it was shaky cam, it was fast cuts, it was way too dark. And there was not, they weren't telling the proper story. I, I couldn't tell what was going on. It's funny, there's a there's a video by a YouTuber called Every Frame a Painting. The guy has, as of this recording, yeah, 1.5 million subscribers. He has a video call that he released five years ago called Jackie Chan, How to Do Action Comedy. And I recommend this video for everybody listening to this right now. After you're done with this podcast, hell, fucking pause this and go watch that. He makes perfect utter fucking sense about how Jackie Chan and people um, in other countries do their action and it's perfect you have one there's one camera looking at everything there's no quick jumps I agree with you 100% that was one of my main gripes of this episode um, but uh, do you want to just get into the whole the whole thing yeah yeah let's do it okay so let's start off with the battle the battle of Winterfell once again I find it very suspicious that Melisandre is coming from the front of like the whole thing, like I thought the army of the dead was already there by the the end of episode yeah. two. How the hell did she manage to sneak by them like that and just? <clears throat> no, it, it 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 made it made very little logical sense. I do get that it was. I mean, when she comes out of the darkness, it's a complete surprise and it's very eerie. And mm-hmm. I'll grant that, like, okay, you know, that's a pretty that's a pretty, it's a pretty great surprise. Um, I wish I wish they would have utilized. Melisandre more or you know like she they likes... were gonna even you yeah. reminded I was watching your review you reminded me that the last time we saw her in season seven she was supposed to go to Volantis for some reason yeah what the fuck happened there we don't we don't know I mean that's the thing is maybe Kinvara will show up doubtful but you know like you, you wish there was some sort of reference to it or, or whatever um but yeah yeah I mean I, that's what I'm saying. Like that scene by itself is so beautifully done and eerie. Mm-hmm. In the context of the whole episode, it doesn't make sense. Like it was so gr- like you know, I was floored when she came out of the darkness. You're like, what? Uh, what? Like that was, and and you know, she. Uh, I I thought they were gonna do like a kind of like, like a cliche thing because. Um, we all know how the Army of the Dead is. I, I, I feel like they don't really need to scare anybody because they have nothing to really prove. But what I thought was going to happen was it was going to be maybe like some kid or something from like the north that they captured to try to demoralize everybody, send in some kid on a horse with like without a head, you know, just to make everybody go, oh, shit, oh, my God. Well, that that would have that been scary, too. Yeah, Yeah. right? But <laughs> Melisandre coming out is even more like, whoa, how did you get past everybody? I was super like, what? How did she get past them? I don't get it. Yeah. But Mel- Melisandre, this episode, started out great, ended out in confusion. Like, I don't understand why she had to die. My-, my thought on the whole matter is is that she used so much of that power that she's not used to using. If you've noticed, Melisandre doesn't use her abilities as often as Thoros, and not to the extent of mm. Thoros and even Beric. And what I was thinking was is that the power that she's been hiding, like, you know, holding back the entire time in her, ne- her necklace has been keeping her young, but when she used it a lot to, 
light up all those Dothraki, we all the Dothraki weapons and the ignite the uh, the fortifications. She used so much so much of it that you know she had to die. Versus a... Thoros who and Beric who've been using it so much that Beric doesn't even get to say the words to light up his sword. One of the things that, you know I'm thinking about about um, Melisandre's entire arc over the entire series, and you know she's so confident, and then Stannis dies, and she becomes very insecure, and then she kind of regains that confidence. But what's funny is that she arrives in this last episode wrong again. Like, you know, it, her, her process, right, is she thought it was Stannis, then she thinks it's Jon, and she arrives in this last episode now certain that it's Arya. And I wish she had just had maybe one more conversation with Davos about her faith and his faith and, and, and like, how she, she came to this point and, like, you know, like, how she was wrong before and she made a lot of mistakes before, but now... She's she's very confident in what she in what she believes, um, you know, and, and how she got there, because because there is that hole, you know, where she thinks it's Stannis. She does. She, then she's insecure. Then she thinks it's John. And then there's a hole between thinking it's John and thinking it's Arya. And I, I, really... I also well, she appears before Danny last season. So at one point she also thought it was Danny as well. Well, yeah. I mean, she 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 she's kind of hedging. I think she she kind of believe she wants Danny to meet John because she thinks John is the you know something. Mm. So yeah, or Kinvara was definitely certain it was Danny. Um, and you know, I, I I guess I I would have liked some some mentioning of that to to really bring, <clears throat> you know, her her arc to an end because her arc came to an end, <clears throat> you know, in the in her she. In her destination, right? She like, she was she was happy, and succeeded, in in discovering, you know, who the prince that was promised was, um, and and destroying the Night King. She she did everything she she wanted, and I guess I I would have liked, you know, more satisfaction or more you know her fe you know feeling and displaying that that before I was wrong, but now I'm right, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, and so, um, I you know I you know I think you know, uh, Kurt, her name Carice Van Houten, um, the the Melisandre actress. Yeah, Carice um, Van Houten, I think it is. Yeah, I mean she was she was fantastic as as always, but I just wish they had just one more conversation with Davos about about her faith and and how she how she, you know her road, you know what she, what she did in Volantis. Did she meet Kinvara? You know, did she get another vision? You like, keep saying Kinvara. I'm sorry, but Kinvara is where is wherever Jiqui is. Like, <laughs> that's never going to come up. That's never going to be a thing. Maybe. Unless people are speculating now that Dario is going to come out of nowhere with the Second Sons and oh, he'll bring right, Kinvara right, right. with him. Um, the other the other whole uh, speculation behind Melisandre just all of a sudden dropping dead is that her mission was to, dis to help defeat the others. And now that her mission is done, she's just... Not yeah. long for this world, and it would it would have been neat to see her, you know, in a new state, you know, blissful, you know, like, like it's odd, you know, for someone who is who has fulfilled their destiny and pleased their god, and has saved the world, like you would think that she would she would have a new emotion, you know, um, I, I I would have liked to see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I don't think they did a horrible job with her arc. I I I, I thought. But I, I, I do think it's the actress doing most of the legwork. Um, you know, her coming, her walking out into the snow was, 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 was well done. It was a good way to end the episode. Um, and her coming out of the darkness was a surprise. None of it made, none, none of it made much sense. But It know, doesn't I, make much sense because I'm sure this is not how, how this is going to go down in the books. And this does feel disjointed. It almost feels like George didn't really tell Dave and Dan how Melisandre's story will play out because he probably doesn't know himself. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. He, he said he didn't tell them about his secondary characters. And mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would guess that Melisandre would count as a secondary character, not a primary. So as Melisandre comes in, she lights their weapons. The Dothraki charge in there. They just charge in there. I can't. I. I don't feel bad for them at all because Dothraki are kind of assholes, and uh, I just see. Th th this is one of those things where because I've played a lot of like Total War games, and I yeah. don't want to like be that asshole. But 
you, you just kind of don't do that. And you so, keep saying you, you keep saying that this is something you've said before multiple times. They have w- castles. They have walls. Just yeah. hide behind them. But what are you going to do with the Dothraki? Well, like, what are you going to do with them? Have uh, them go away and then come back and try to flank? Do- that Dothraki, Dothraki don't have to be on horses. They can they can be archers on the on the on the battlements. Um, no, I mean one one thing I judge about this. It's like okay, like I'm a super big dork and I've played a lot of video games and I've read a little bit about you know warfare and stuff like that. And so it's like okay, I'm not maybe I'm not the best person to 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 judge whether something is you know, logical and screen for, for a casual. But the thing is I sit in my office and it's not like in my office, I, you know, there's some people that know about my channel, but, but for the most part, I don't broadcast it. And, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and then I'll, then I'll hear a game of Thrones conversation happen. And so I hear what the casuals say and the casuals were like, yeah, I don't understand why they would just like, <laughs> like charge all of the Dothraki at the horde. Like that doesn't seem very useful. Like why aren't they hiding in the castle? Like like I hear casuals saying that. Like why wouldn't they be in the castle? Like like a random person on the street seems to understand that castle walls like protect you and that you'd stay inside. You know. Well, to be fair, they're fighting the army of the dead. This is not conventional warfare where you know we've seen siege battles before um battle of the blackwater and yeah. th- these uh those men were afraid to die these things are mindless so castle walls kind of like once again world war z um those zombies uh, the walls around israel they still like charged that stuff and were able to go over it so i once again i really don't feel like walls would have done much yeah but those walls those it's, it's not really fair because the the um I mean, it, well, actually, the the that the wall between between the West Bank and and Israel proper, there there are there are battlements at, at certain parts. No, I'm but, talking about in the movie World War Z. Yeah, the... yeah, but but you know, well, it's the same supposedly the same wall. They it's it's a really weird political statement. I'm not even sure what what they're what they're saying in the movie, but they, they, you know, the the Israelis built this barrier between. Um, between uh, most of the West, it's most of the wall is in the West Bank, but uh, between the West Bank and Israel and, and in World War Z, the, you know, the zombies are able to climb over it. But, but um, there are battlements at certain parts, like towers and stuff to, uh, at, at various parts. Um, but the big, in the movie, there's not that. You don't have Israeli soldiers on top of the wall, uh, like, you know, dropping boiling oil and <laughs> and shooting down at the zombies. Mm. Um, in in you know in medieval in the medieval situation, you do have that. And and one thing that was frustrating is that when they got to the battlements point, they didn't have enough people. Sam Tarley was was sitting there, you know, fighting. And you're like, why don't you have dedicated archers and stuff? Like, um, like that's the way to do it, not just toss all of your people. I think that the idea was to hold off the attack while trying to get, because if they get into Winterfell, chances are they could get to Bran, even if he's in the Godwood. Even if he's in the Godswood, like Theon was the last line of defense, and I guess the Mormons, to some extent, were also the last line of defense inside Winterfell. But everybody, I guess, was trying to hold off everything they can while John and Danny went in there and tried to kill the Night King because they right. knew. I mean, I think the only solu- the only solution to it is that they had they had to they had to lose. They wanted to have a bad military strategy in order to get the Night King in there. I mean, the use of walls is obviously like a big part of the story. There being a wall that kept out the White Walkers for 8,000 years. So, you know, the idea that walls are freaking good against undead is kind of, you know, a fundamental aspect of the story. Um, but I don't know. They didn't, they didn't do that. It, it was... It well, the, the the battle was was weird for for bits that we could see. Once again, I'm not gonna bitch about the darkness the entire time. But I did think at, at one point I was I felt really I felt really bad for everybody that was just like straight up dying there because it, it felt at that point it just felt like kicking a puppy. Like you just felt so bad for everybody on the front lines. And I'm survived. I'm surprised anybody survived that. I'm surprised Tormund, like all our usual characters, with the exception of Ed, who rest in peace, yeah. good buddy. But I'm surprised Tormund. God, what a tank! What a fucking right, tank! Right, I mean, I, I I was actually surprised so many characters survived. 
I'm surprised Tormund survived. I'm surprised Davos survived. I'm surprised Gendry survived. Where was Davos? I, I, I love how you even mentioned it too. Like, where was he the entire time? I saw him. I saw him at the beginning and then at the end. I never see him in any anywhere yeah. in between. Or Bronte on Royce. I mean, he's just Bronte where is he? Royce, no, where is non-existent he? this episode. <laughs> non-existent. Uh, yeah, no, no, no explanation. And 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 it's a weird thing because you know you, you watch the the inside the episode at the end and they talk about how like oh we've got all these characters and we had to talk we had to deal with all of them during this during this battle and it's like no you didn't you didn't deal with any of them like is it possible that Bronzion Royce he went off to treat with uh, Sweet Robin and maybe perhaps we'll see we'll we'll see Sweet Robin in the next episode he went to go get Sweet Robin. I guess so, but he was he was at the the military council like the night before, right? I don't I don't remember seeing him there. Yeah, I don't. you know, he was definitely there. But was like, he there? He was, yeah, he was standing next to next to Alice Karstark. Like I don't remember. You know, Tormund comes in and and says, "Oh, he'll be here before sundown," and then they have their military council, and then everybody goes and drinks. Mm. And that's the weird thing is they have this, and that's a, in retrospect, episode two isn't going to work anymore. Because the thing about episode two, it, w- it was this nostalgic episode. Like, oh my God, we're dying tomorrow. Let's sit around and drink and, and do things like like honor Brienne and, and things like that. And then all of those characters end up living. So there's nothing nostalgic about it anymore. Like had they had that circle and then half of them are dead, then, oh, you know, that's, that's kind of a last drink. You know, this is the end. Um but now that now that episode is ruined by the fact that they all survived. True. And that that's what I was kind of afraid of. I mean, because at one point the actress the actress for Brand uh, Gwendolyn Christie, she is an amazing actress. Her her screams. Like I felt at least 3 times during the episode. I've seen it 3 times. 3 times during the episode, every single time I watch it, it it, it seems like she's dying. Those are death screams. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I don't and know. The, and and I have to say like the Sam the Sam actor um um, God, I was see. You're so good at the actor names, and I'm so bad. Oh, John Bradley. John Bradley, like he was, he was fucking, he was great. He was, he really like had this, um, uh, you know, like his wallowing in puddles of blood, like, and you're just like, like just so sad, like so sad and pathetic. And it was, I do think it was kind of, you know, amusing at the end where John runs in and he sees Sam like. And he just like, ignores it. Yeah, he just ignores it. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, thought he, I thought he was going to stop and like grab Sam. Come on. But no, he just ran off and just yeah. tried to do his own thing. And that's the thing is like, like both of them were doing such a great job in that battle. Like, like, uh, you know, putting forward their, their agony and having them have an agony death would have been, would have been uh, interesting, you know, cause Ed, he ends up dying too fast, and and um, and Jorah's death was not really very realistic. He just keeps getting up over and over again. Theon's was was pretty was pretty good and pretty sad. I, you know, I, I I have to say, like just the way Alfie Alfie Allen, like you know, we'll, we'll get to scene. Theon because I actually yeah. have an idea of what I wanted to happen with Theon. But we, we expected Jorah and Grey Worm to die because yes. Grey Worm gave his retirement speech. And by the laws of action cliches, he was supposed to die the, like the next hour, and he didn't. He fucking survived, which I am thoroughly shocked at because, holy, like, like the Unsullied really probably were the MVP soldiers of that of that fight. They held the line so well and they got mm. they, they kept getting their heads chopped off. The the whites are way more dangerous than than zombies because zombies will just come at you with bite and claw. These guys will do that and they'll stab you. And they'll like, you know, sword slash you. Like they're they're crazy. And I got to say the one thing I, I did love about this episode was that it showed us that the White Walkers are sentient enough to form battle strategies. So if you think about it, when we first see the White Walkers in episodes one um, and later on in episode uh, 10 of season two at the very end, they have no armor on. And then mm-hmm. season three comes around, Sam kills one of them, and then next time we see them, they're all wearing armor, yeah. right? And then in the in the Hard Home episode... They, they're so used to fighting wildlings with shit weapons that the White Walkers themselves started being used as frontline shock troops, like commanding officers, and they would go in there and fight until Jon Snow kills one of them, even in armor, 
And there is a scene where the Night King sees this. The, right after where Jon Snow shatters the White Walker, the Night King is looking down at him. And the next time we see them, during the White Retrieval mission, the Night King will not go out. Night King will not allow himself or the other White Walkers to go out and fight them. They're standing from afar until Danny's dragons show up and turn the tide. In this battle, the, the White uh, Walker generals just stood back the entire time. When the dragons came around, yeah. they unleashed that whirlwind. To, to prevent that vision from them. So they they are using battle tactics and strategy. And even even when Jon Snow falls off Rhaegal and charges <clears> at the Night King, he's not overconfident enough to where he's willing to risk his life fighting Jon Snow. He knows better. So what he does instead is he does that little trick he does by raising everybody around Jon. Yeah, I mean, well, he's smart until he's not smart, right? I mean, <laughs> to be fair, he thought he had won. He thought everything was right there in his grasp, and he had won. I mean, that last moment with the Night King where he's there, he sees Theon. He doesn't order all the whites to attack both Theon and Bran. That was his mistake. He, 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 he feels like he's safe and comfortable, especially with his White Walker generals behind him. He feels like he's, he's got this in the bag. All he has to do is just snap Bran's neck or, or take right, him out, but, and he doesn't. Know, he should have. He, I mean, obviously, had, had he waited 30 more minutes... Like maybe he would have had everything, but yeah. What's up with uh? What's up with Danny's dragon not killing him with with dragon fire? Uh, I mean, I guess we we did kind of establish during um, um, season six to hold hold the door mm. that they can just kind of put out fire and aren't really hurt by fire. So they can or he can because. I'm going to go ahead and assume that the Night King is the one that makes all the other White Walkers, and he makes them by having actual humans, actually, actual human sacrifices. Right. Well, I mean, we saw him transform the Craster's baby into a, um, into a White Walker, right? So does he touch the baby, and the baby's eyes go blue, and then the baby yeah. just g grows into a full-size human? Yeah, and who knows how long that takes, but yeah, that, that's, I, I suppose, what we have to assume. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, I, I got to say, as much as this episode had its problems, I do like that they had battle tactics. One of the reasons uh, people say that the Night King wasn't hurt by Dragonfire is because he was made with uh, Dragonglass, and Dragonglass in Old Valyria is known as Frozen Fire. <coughs> well, yeah, but, you know, obviously that's just a name. I mean, Dragonglass is nothing but obsidian, right? So the, right. Thing, hurting, the, the thing hurting him is silicon. Or whatever's inside the silicon, maybe some sort of element, other element. Um, it's not fire that's hurting him. It's 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 some other element. Well, my, my um, thought is that because he was created through magic, any magical creature can't hurt him. And ma even though dragons aren't really magical creatures per se, you can argue that they are their connection. They have connection to magic, hmm. regardless. Hmm. So, yeah. I don't like what they said in the uh, behind the episode where the only way to kill the Night King was to stab him in the one place he was created. That's fucking Oh, stupid. God, that, first of all, that pissed me off, because, one, he was not created there. Like, there's, like, ugh. Oh, no, That's what creepy. I noticed. I, everybody kept saying, well, Arya stabbed him in the same place. Did she, though? No, she didn't. No, she definitely did not. Like, <laughs> the Night King is created in the mountains, with next to the Arrowhead Mountain, the one that, that, uh, that the Hound sees in his vision. And mm -hmm. the one from the most famous mountain in Iceland, okay? Like, it's a very famous... I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it because it's you can't pronounce anything in Icelandic. But there's the, 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 the mountain that, um, that the, the, the hound sees in his vision is the most famous mountain in Iceland. It's, it's, it's a national monument. It's a very striking, like, clear mountain. And the, uh, when the Night King is created, that mountain is clearly in the background. Um, I visited that spot <laughs> like mm. when I went when I went to Iceland, it's mm -hmm. part of my like my Game of Thrones tour. And so when they said like, oh, you know, he was he was destroyed in the exact same spot that he was created, no. No he wasn't. <laughs> Like, well, no, I meant the exact same spot that he was created, like, in... She, she, uh, no, the, I mean, he, Dan and Dave said that in the, in the, in the inside of the episode. No, no, like, what, oh, what, he, what, what, they, what I meant to say by that is, and what, what they meant was, she stabbed him in the exact same spot where the dragon glass went in. Well, that didn't seem the case either, right? It seemed I thought she, she stabbed him more in the gut, but I couldn't really I tell. thought she stabbed him more in, like, that little area between your stomach and, and, and your chest. But they, he said, but they said in the, in the inside the episode that 
in the spi- in the same place, and then they said the spiral of trees. And I, I, like, I thought they Ugh. said that she stabbed him in the same spot where the children were the dragon glass went into. I'll have to, I'll have to watch this again. I thought he I thought he had mentioned the um the the the, the tree spiral. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, I understand like the same place and the same place. Like it's two different two different things. All right. Uh, but on the topic man. of the Night King, I everybody thought that. John was going to kill him. And, I, and quite frankly, I was waiting for a 1v1 with the Night King. And I think Jon Snow was waiting for this as well. Everybody was waiting for this. And quite frankly, I do like how Jon is racing in Winterfell. He's trying to get to the Godswood. He can't. There's just chaos happening. I like the parts where he's trying to get there and the zombies are all falling on top of him. And he locks the gate and they're like, ah, come here. Yeah, yeah. And he's trying to get there and he can't. Uh, uh... Yeah, and I do, think, I do think the visuals of bodies falling from the sky because... I, it's funny because somebody in the office later was like, I heard them talking about it and they're like, ah, oh, bodies were falling from the sky and at first I didn't understand why and then I was like, oh, right. They might be falling off of Danny's dragon. I was like, oh, oh I actually didn't catch that. That's, well, that's I thought I thought they were falling because they were they, they were just climbing over the, Yeah, the, the and then running, running in there mindlessly, right. But um, it would have been, you know, it might be that they're falling off the dragon too. That would have been interesting because it's so chaotic, yeah. right? Yeah. So I mean, the visual of like, it, it, you know, it's it's it is absurd. Like that last scene is absurd, where he's running around and there's just blood and people everywhere, and there's bodies falling from the sky, and then there's a dragon after him. It was it's so over the top absurd that it was it was it was a good scene. I do I do like John running around. Yeah. So, someone in the comment section, I think, of your videos said like the dragon was able to the Night King had the dragon blast Winterfell and, and destroy the wall. But for some reason, the dragon, uh, Viserion? Viserion? Every um, fucking time, Viserion couldn't blast that rock that, whatever the fuck that was, that John was hiding behind. Yeah, I mean, one could argue that, you know, he, he's had his neck ri- ripped open, so maybe mm. it wasn't as powerful. I don't know. Mm, that's a, that's just, a good argument. Yeah, whatever. But, uh, no, so, so, I will say before we get to the whole thing, the Arya stuff, um... I did like how Arya goes from, you know, trying to take them all out. She does get her head knocked in a little. And that's yeah. where she starts to lose that bit of confidence when we see her running around. I do like how Arya goes from, like, quick action, fucking these guys up, to fear and panic and just doing kind of like a like a video game stealth mission in the libraries. That I actually kind of, kind of like that. It I don't gave, know. I, w- I would have liked that scene more had they given it to Gilly. <laughs> no, I mean honestly, like you I mean, mentioning I, that makes my blood boil. I hate that fucking. Oh, character. then 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 give it to Davos. Like give it to somebody that's not fu- not a. But da- but 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 can Davos really sneak around like that as well as she can? Or then give it to Sansa. Can Sansa do that? No, I. I mean, sneak <laughs> around under tables and like, I mean, that would have made more sense. Like Arya going around, it just didn't make any sense to me. I mean. Uh. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, but I, I will say though, the one thing Dave and Dan in the behind the episode scene, what, what they did say that I do agree with was it's constant battle, 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 and you do need those moments where the audience can breathe and just calm down a bit. So I like that little stealth mission she went on. Um, down in the crypts of Winterfell, we said how it was stupid that these fucking skeletons could punch through stuff. <laughs> yeah. You, I'm, I'm so glad you, t- you took this because I forgot to say it in my own video. Um, the first skeleton that comes out in the robes, I think that was Maester Lewin. You think he wouldn't be buried in the crypts? Where would he be buried then? Instead, the, the crypts are only for Starks. Mm, that's a good point. I, but... So I, I think it's just a random. I mean, it's 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 funny because I'm like in, in my video, I'm like, well, the most intact skeletons are gonna be like Rickon and Ned, and then everybody's like, but Ned is his, he was boiled and his head was cut off. I'm like, he's still the most intact body. Like he, like he's still <laughs> like 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 bodies. You know, the flesh is gonna rot off. You know. And the skin is going to rot off within a year. The bones, it's going to take, you know, 20 to 30 years before bones essentially become dust. Um, I mean, um, unless they're mummified or something like that, uh, which, you know, if, if it's super dry, maybe. But like, no, like it's moist and damp down there. Like, mm-hmm. like there, there should be nothing but dust in all of those crypts. But the you know if there is going to be a body, it's going to be you know the grandfather or the grandmother or Rickon or Sa- or or Ned and and they didn't go that route. I'm surprised they didn't say, eh, you know, get the Rickon actor back and have him be a have him come back as a um, as a white attacking Sansa, which is 
you know, I would say that that would have been really interesting. <laughs> I, I feel like that, that's what you would have done if you were one of the writers. I would have because one, Sansa, Sansa never really got hers for for losing faith in 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 betraying Rickon. Rickon, I, I'll forgive her for that because she was with Ramsay and she knows how brutal yeah. he is, and she knows that Ramsay would never release him. Right, and Rickon, and Rickon never really got enough screen time or resolution, and it would be it would be it would be brutal. It, it would also be very George R. R. Martin to to have freaking family members come back and attack you. Like, well, while we're on the topic of the Crips, I thought Sansa and Tyrion were going to kill themselves. They really made it seem that way. Yeah, my God. Like, what else were they? What else? How else are you supposed to interpret that scene? In your video, you said that they're technically still married. Not true. They never consummated it. Well, I mean, married but not consummated. I mean, I guess they're, they're still in limbo. Mm. I, I don't know. But um, let let's get to the let's get to the the one thing I, I everybody wants us to talk about, which is the fact that Jon Snow wasn't the one that killed the Night King. Now I like yeah. the reason Dave and Dan gave for this, and it's the Ryan Johnson defense. It's mm. the it's what Ryan Johnson said about his choices for the Last Jedi. It subverts your expectation, right? So we're we're all thinking that Jon Snow he's gonna kill the Night King. He's gonna do it. And at one point I thought so too. I got frustrated as all hell. Because I thought, come on, John, what are you doing? Like, get out of there. Like, go, go, go to the godswood. Go, fight him. But that didn't happen. As we all saw, Arya kills the Night King. It sub- they subverted our expectations. Yeah. The one thing I fucking hate that people keep saying is, especially about, we're going we're gonna to move this to Star Wars just for a minute, guys. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of analogies to Star Wars. Right. The one thing I keep, I hate when people say is that, you just don't like The Last Jedi because you thought Snoke was Darth Plagueis and he wasn't Darth Plagueis. So you just don't like it because there's a diff. You can still subvert someone's expectations and still miss the mark. Well, the, and that's the thing. I, I suppose on a, on a certain level, we have to judge when we come to the last episode. Like if the big bad is Cersei, um, then yes, it's subverted, subverted expectations, but it it just was it was a letdown because you had the big bad before and then you had somebody that was not nearly as bad and you just you, that's just not how you structure a story ever like you want to have a climax you don't want to um so i mean the the perfect kind of george r, r. martin ending is you subvert the expectation but the subversion is more logical and fitting than what you were expecting you know so like the red wedding subverts people's expectations because, you know, and it, and it works because you've got Rob and you think he's a hero and, you're not, and they're not going to kill off this hero character. But the subversion is logical. It was foreshadowed, majorly foreshadowed. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you were told over and over again, there's going to be, you know, consequences for, for um, you know, betraying the, betraying the phrase. And... It, everything is leading there, and and so it's subverted because the hero is killed. But you get to a place that's unexpected, but you know, ironically, more fitting, and that's what you really want, right? Um, and so the, the the question is, is like, and we, so we still have three more three more episodes. Um, is Cersei the big bad, or is there going to be another big bad? Um, if they really wanted subvert of expectations, Danny becomes the big bad but how well, cliche would that be well the thing i mean this gets back to like the, the theory that i've been you know pushing for years like how the children of the forest are the secret big bad and that you know so like so you know there is there is this idea that maybe that you know if if bran is really an agent of the children of the forest that he's the big bad and that he's actually the one like causing all of this trouble and getting everybody killed you know, like, why did he feel he needed to tell John of his parentage? His parentage is going to do nothing but create a division between him and Danny. You know, and so so it may be that the Night King is, is subverted because there's a bigger bad than the Night King. Um, and we're going to be happy with that subversion. I think if the subversion is, oh, we're going to kill the Night King and then the final battle is, against, is going to be against Cersei. Well, then that's going to be a huge letdown. So I think it all depends what's coming. Mm. I mean, I mean, right it's, it's, right now it all feels like huge letdown. Yeah, and and that's everybody's problem is that they build up the Night King, and the threat of the White Walkers for many, many, many seasons, and he's taken out by a girl. Now, 
this is the conversation I wanted to have with you because Sunday comes, we watch the episode, I you know, blah, 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 blah. I go to sleep, I wake up on Monday, and I go on Twitter, and I see trending, Arya Stark is trending, Arya, and Mary Sue. Now, this is the, th- so this is the thing I wanted to discuss with you. Everybody yeah. is saying that Arya is a Mary Sue. Now, for those of you, because there are people that don't know, in the audience who don't know what a Mary Sue is, Preston, real quick, can you explain to the audience what the hell that is? I mean, a, a Mary Sue is usually a character that that is a, um, a female, unrealist- right? But he's like unrealistically perfect. Usually, fe- you know, usually female. But like, but um, you know, it's usually a strong woman character. But then it's it's a but there, it's a little more nuanced than that. In that it has to be an undeserving strong female who's just naturally good at everything for no reason at all. And 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 who's the most prolific Mary Sue right now in in fiction? Ray. Well, people would say Ray. Ray right? from but Star she Wars. Just, now, she was just born with the ability to Right. Yeah. Ray from Star Wars. Now, a lot of people will will argue to the death on this. And I don't know how you can because apparently Mary Sue is not a legitimate criticism anymore. It is. I don't care what you fucking say. Don't use some bullshit ad hominem on me trying to say, well, Carmine, you think so because you're a racist, misogynistic, so, so, so. Don't, don't take that bullshit elsewhere. Don't fucking come at me with that stuff. Let's be clear. As much as I love Star Wars, Rey is a Mary Sue. She's better at fixing the Falcon than Han Solo, the guy who's had it for years. She can, she can use force powers like a day after learning that it's a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, she can beat one of the guys that's so fucking good at, you know, using a lightsaber after never even picking one up ever. Like, Ray really is a Mary Sue. Is Arya Stark a Mary Sue? No. No. I would, I would say no. 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 I, I mean, considering that, like, a huge chunk of her story is about training. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, she, she gets trained. She gets, she has two different trainers. Like, you know, there's an entire journey to her. Maybe you can argue that it's rushed or that... You it know, is they, rushed, though, because yeah. I I hated Arya Stark. I, bleh, let me rephrase that. I hated Arya's journey for a good chunk of season four because all she did for two seasons was travel around. Actually, no, what she did for almost three seasons was just travel around. Season three, all she did was travel around. Season four, <coughs> most yeah. of what she did was travel around. I think she should have entered the House of Black and White midway through season four Got all the ini- Remember what she did for a good chunk of season five? She like cleaned dead bodies and like swept yeah. the place and learned that, how that, to that, lie. That is my that is my problem with her training. Like it's rushed, but it's there. I mean, it's the same. I mean, Luke Skywalker. I mean, we, we can take gender out of it and and say that Luke Skywalker's training was super rushed and unrealistic, or that a character like Neo from the Matrix is a complete Mary Sue because he's just born with the freaking ability. Well, well, the male version but, is Gary Stu. But uh, like, yeah. to defend Luke Skywalker for a minute here, he trained, and there were you know. Uh, uh, slabs of time where you know we, we didn't see Luke and yeah, I mean, any he it was uh, anywhere from one week to to a year on that planet on Dagobah. We have no idea, right? But, because like the, the whole time differences between start, planets yeah. and galaxies. Emp- is Empire different. Strikes Back has 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 you know Game of Thrones level like traffic lo- travel logic, but right. But but, the, but um, Luke trained with Yoda, a Jedi Master, and he went and tried to beat Darth Vader, and he still lost. That's the problem. Yeah. That's the difference between Luke and Ray. A lot of people love to say, like, you know, Luke and Ray, Luke and Ray. No, Luke still lost. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, and, and Arya also had her periods of time of getting her butt kicked and, like, um, and, and things like that. And and I made fun of the fact that quite a bit that, like, you know, Arya got stabbed and, you know, unrealistically healed, but... Then again, John came back from the dead too. I mean, you can argue all of these different. Well, things, what I'm arguing so. with against the Arya healing thing, this is this is the, my one argument against that is because when she drank from that little well in the House of Black and White, that that water could have given her some abilities to heal and protection against disease. Because after she stabbed, she's fa- she falls in that dirty uh, canal water and she's fine. Right, so I, I'm gonna argue that the the water she drank from, as an assassin, you're gonna go to places that you've never been to before. You have yeah. to have that immunity, and the water gives you that immunity. <clears throat> That's my answer to that. But I would have liked for Arya to have trained from the middle of season four all the way to like to season six, and then go on missions, and then you know yeah. start to I mean, fall the, away. The, the Arya story has some. The Arya Game of Thrones story has some serious pacing issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, that most thing characters she's, do. She's sweeping and washing bodies, and you're bored to tears. And then, and then they're like, "Okay, montage time." And then it's montage, montage. You know, past time in a montage. And then, and then she's a freaking. Then she knows everything. 
Like, like that stuff was we my didn't issue. even see in the montage. See, this is the this is the amount of hate that we got for season seven on our criticism of Arya. She didn't finish her training. She's adequate. She she used a, a cool trick, I'll admit, to beat the waif. I'll admit that was a cool trick. But at the same time, she never really finished her training. I don't think she ever even killed anybody. <clears throat> Remember, she was well, supposed to kill that one guy that bites the coin? Right, right. She never kills him. The um, Well, the thing is, we, we have to accept that, like, you know, you, you can create a hierarchy of who are the greatest fighters, you know, in the Westeros. So, like, the Night King... Like, Arya is better than the Night King, but the Waif is actually a better fighter than Arya. You know, or like, John is a really great fighter, but, um, fuck, what was his name? Uh, uh, who, is the, who is the guy that, like, kicked John's ass in, in, in season Oh, uh, Clubfoot Carl. Clubfoot Carl kicks John. Like, Clubfoot Carl Play, is clearly played, the played greatest by, fighter ever. Yeah. Played by uh, Burn Gorman. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so he's, he's clearly the best fighter to ever exist. So, like, him... And the Waif, if they teamed up, man, they would have been unstoppable. <laughs> I love your logic there. <laughs> to be fair, though, the Night King did grab Arya's neck. And, you know, he... Okay, so so let's, let's just close out this conversation. Arya is not a Mary Sue. And and I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, well, well, Carmine, you've been hanging out with Preston a lot, you know, and he's a feminist. Maybe that's really... No, it's not. And I know you hate when I say this, but... It is possible for someone not to be a feminist, but still understand and, and believe the core tenets of feminism and not be no, one of I part mean, of the group. It, it, it's, it's not. I mean, I'm a feminist, but I understand, like, what can be seen as pandering. Um, and, right. And the, and the Aria badass thing um, often comes off as pandering. You know, and, and you get these headlines the next day like, ah, oh, girl power. You're like, OK, explain to me how a psychopath like stabbing an undead monster thingo like like has any relationship to the the relationship between men and women mm -hmm. in, in modern society it does like what is this like yeah what is like like aria stabbing the night king like doesn't doesn't like teach me anything about reproductive rights or you know job place salary <laughs> equity like like these things like like it's 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 retarded to even like go to these lo locations because they're so different like like some psychopath in pop cultural pop culture stabbing a, a, an ice monster like has nothing to do with you know all these very important issues that people need to you know pay attention to and vote about but you know instead everything gets conf like confused and conflated about you know with these like these strange stand-ins that people are trying to market and, and make money off of. Well, know, it's fan so. service to like a group of people that, you know, like who cares? Who cares? I, I don't care if, 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 if I don't, it, it's not that I, I, it's not that I hate that the reason Arya killed the Night King is because she's female. That's not why I dislike it. I dislike it because I think the character, you, she was definitely in the top five list of, of people who would kill the Night King. Brienne, Jamie, Jon Snow, Danny, and Arya. Who else could have done it in that fucking cast? Who else could have? Tormund? Right. Not really. He's not he's not main character status enough to really hone it in. The one character I would have preferred to actually have killed the Night King and still make sense to prophecy was Theon. Theon, you could argue, was born... I mean, yeah. smoke, maybe not, but amid salt and smoke... You know, the Ironborn love to say their blood is, you know, salt and iron. Um, you know, Theon was the Prince of Winterfell. There's an entire episode devolved to that title in season two, the Prince of Winterfell. Yeah. And what else? Um, he was reborn, you could argue. When Ramsay tortures the shit out of him and makes him reek, he comes back later, redeems himself some in a sense, and is kind of reborn uh, by saving his quote unquote love, <clears throat> Nisa Nisa, yeah. which could be Sansa. Like, there's so many arguments of why Theon would have been a better choice to kill the Night King. He was the first person on the show to take Winterfell, and he'll be the last person to defend it, in a sense. Right, right. I mean, <clears throat> if prophecy, you know, means anything, right? <laughs> right, if prophecy means anything. And in what, the books, what, I'm what, sure I, it what does. I do, what I do hate is, is when people like, in retrospect, like, twist stuff to make it prophecy. Like, even in the show, they did this. Like, oh, we're going to take some random throwaway line that, that Melisandre said to Arya, like, you know, in season three or four, and try to claim that that was some sort of foreshadowing. No, it wasn't. You, you know, they had to twist the line to make it even remotely fit. You know, but... Yeah. Well, to so, be fair, the eyes you'll take forever. Green eyes, <clears throat> blue eyes, brown eyes. Brown eyes, Walder Frey. 
uh, Blue Eyes, the Night King, unfortunately. So who's Green Eyes? Uh, people have been telling me Green well, Eyes well, is Peter Baelish. Well, I mean, in in the book he has gray green eyes, but uh, who knows what he has in the in the uh, who Walter Frey? No, Peter Baelish. Okay. Um, what is, I, I don't know uh, Aiden Gillian's uh, eye color, but uh, so so you. You, we and I are in agreement. Uh, Arya's not a Mary Sue, but the whole her killing the Night King is fucking stupid. Well, you know, under under different circumstances, and again, it depends on like who the big bad is and things like that. Um, you know, I, it's not like I couldn't be open to it, but I, I, you know, I just I don't think it was done well. Like I don't think her, f- you know, flying out of nowhere as this like smirky, cocky, like little shit. <laughs> is is a great character to have kill the night king you know like because that's that's who that's who Arya is right now she's the snot-nosed like cocky piece of shit like jesus christ no but seriously it's like she, she she bakes people into pies and stuff like that like i don't know like it's just now you know is is it very george r, r. martin like would george r. r martin do something like this absolutely <laughs> you know like, what oh george r, r. martin loves the Arya character type. Well, before we like, go into that, once again, are we in agreement that Arya was not really deserving of that that honor of killing the Night King? It should have been Theon. Can we agree on that? Uh, or do who you, deserves to kill the Night King? Yeah, that's what I was um, saying. You have someone else in mind that deserves to kill the Night King beyond Theon? Because I think Theon had a much better uh, story progression throughout the entire series than Arya did. I mean, I think Theon suffered the most, you know, and, and like, you know, needs, needs that kind of, uh, needs that kind of release. Um, who would I, who would I have killed the Night King? I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Don't fucking say Sam, because I know you love Sam. No, 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 no. I know you love Sam. I would never have Sam do it. Um, I kind of feel like the Hound. Mm. Um... Uh, that would probably be my choice. You, but you can't have the Hound kill the Night King and his brother at the same time. Well, I wouldn't have him fight his brother. I think him fighting his brother goes against everything that the Hound should stand for mm. and, like, his arc. Like, I, I think Clegane Ball, is a, is, the idea of it is a complete betrayal. Oh, um, this is interesting. We'll go into this later, but continue. Yeah, but, it, it, and, and for that reason, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, for that same reason, maybe I wouldn't. I mean, only because the Night King is, like, this supernatural being could I have, have the Hound fight him. Like, you know, it's like I kind of want the Hound to be a pacifist. Like, I saw his, you know, you know I want his character to go that way. Um, let me think of somebody else that would be, a per- that would be, that would be uh, more appropriate to kill, to kill the Night King. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, go- I'm, like, going through them all. I'm like, would it be appropriate for Yara? You know, okay, now we're no, just going no, no, no. off into random fucking. Characters. Well, no, I'm just. Oh. No, you know who would be? You know who would be? But he be, would be fantastic to kill the Night King. Is this a serious answer? No, this is a serious answer. Go ahead, Cersei. <laughs> I I asked you if this was a serious answer. Why you gotta lie? No, to no, me? no. It's a, Why you gotta lie to me? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely serious answer. That, that Cersei. Would be, yeah, absolutely. That would be that'd be a much more like. Like fitting kind of thing, yeah. Go ahead, I'm I'm listening. Go ahead, explain this one. Uh, I mean, in the in the sense that you're taking this character, um, that that's that uh, <laughs> that you well one you're going for the unexpected, and and she she's she's her, Cersei's character has always been about like destroying patriarchy and stuff like that, and and like feeling that I mean if this is really about like what like the uh the girl power kind of thing like if, if the night king really represents patriarchy like um cersei is the one that was the most is the most bitter against it um and you know when you're really talking about like who would be able to get in there and and be be a threat that the night king wouldn't expect um you know Arya, who like is who's who's muscled and trained or like somebody who'd who would like get close to him, and he would think would be would be harmless, and then would would sneak in a dagger or something, you know? <laughs> Sir, I don't know, man. I, you know, somebody where he'd put his guard down. Theon is my choice. I feel like he's he's the one that nobody would have expected. If the Night King came in and Theon charged at him, and the Night King didn't even kill him, just slapped him to the side really hard against the wall, 
it's a, also, if you think of it this way, it's an insult to Theon that he's not even worth, like, killing in, in that moment. But that would be his mistake. Have Arya come in, and she will try to, like, stab him. She'll fail. He'll throw her aside, and then Theon comes in, and boom, he takes out the Night King. I think Theon is the most deserving of that. It also subverts expectations, because Jon is the one everybody thought was going to do it. Jon or Danny, or at least Jaime, because there, there's a huge, huge theory that Jaime is the prince that was promised. Now, I will say that that George R. R. Martin, almost all of his stories end in a big anticlimactic way where the big bad is not killed by the hero. Mm. Um, and so the fact that John didn't kill the Night King, like, you know, that is that is very George R. R. Martin. We can expect that to happen in the books. If there is a Night King, you know, um, I would see I, I could see George R. R. Martin choosing Arya. To kill him. So, one, so you said he likes her a lot. Well, he loves he loves the Arya clone, and and I've, there's a lot of stories that that um, are where he has a character similar to Arya, this this tomboyish, um, strong female character. And, and and if you look at if you look at the characters of say Lyanna Stark or 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 Yara slash Asha, they're essentially just Arya again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know he he has this like character in his mind, and and he he likes that character. It's the type of know? one that he also goes for as well, right? The strong female character. Who, yeah, the rebel. yeah. The, str- the strong, wild, you know, sassy, uh, gender bending, um, kind of kind of you know pa- you know character. This is this is the hero of a lot of stories. You know, lonely song of Lauren Dor, bitter blooms, all these different thi- all these different stories. Mm-hmm. You, you'll, you'll find you'll find this very similar character. Uh, he loves it. You know, night at the Tarn House, all, all sorts of different stuff. Um, so I could see him, you know, wanting her to be the, the true hero. Not, you know, it's George R. R. Martin rarely has a a Jon Snow type of, you know, hetero norm like hero Keanu Reeves type character be the hero. Um, and so this is why Jon Snow is kind of unusual, you know, that he even has such a prominent role. Um, in a George R. R. Martin story. It's funny you say this is because there was an there was an article. I'll send it to you. I forgot to send it to you these articles. I'm so sorry, bro. There's an uh, Entertainment Weekly article where it came out right after the episode, and apparently they interviewed uh, Maisie Williams and Kit Harrington. Mm-hmm. And Kit Harrington said, "I thought I was going to be the one to do it." And yeah, yeah. Uh, Maisie Williams says when they did the table reading and she found out that she was going to kill the Night King, she immediately knew that most of the fans would not like it. And she kind of came oh, around sure. to it when they started filming it because she's never really done a battle scene before ever. No, no, no. But the so the other the other thing that's very George R. R. Martin <clears throat> is, um, so often the big bad is killed by somebody that's not the hero. So for instance, in Fever Dream, the big bad is actually killed by his henchmen. Um, in in Armageddon Rag, the big bad is not killed and is determined not to be the big bad. Um, and in dying of the light, uh, again, the big bad is like, they end up killing themselves before you're, everybody's gearing up for this big battle. And then it turns out that, you know, they kill it, they kill themselves. Um, and then the final battle, which doesn't even happen, um, is between the protagonist and like the secondary, like guy. And then the, the story ends before the battle even happens. So George R. R. Martin does like to have anti-climax. He does like to have somebody else kill the big bad. He does love the Arya type, um, sassy, gender-bending, strong female. Um, so all, all of these things do fit. Um, so, you know, if this is getting closer to George R. R. Martin's ending, um, and that's the thing is like, are you still confident that there's going to be time travel again? Because I'm still confident there's going to be time travel. So someone sent me a message on, on, on Patreon, and they're like, you know, um, what do you think about the Bran storyline, and why does it even exist within the story? And I still think that Bran is going to do some type of time traveling thing. I don't know. After this, because I, I firmly believe that the Night King was going to kill everybody, Bran's going to go back in time, do blah, 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 blah. Guess we're not doing that. Guess we're not going to butterfly affect it, which is fine. Once again, I'm completely okay with that. But... At this point, <laughs> well, the the story the story that I've been going for for years like is that the children of the for- the children of the forest like they're the true enemy. Are, are, they're the true enemy, and they've been setting up humanity to kill itself. Mm. And the, the the White Walkers are humans, 
and they just they created these white walkers and they sent them against you know they they they, they created a war between between uh, like the others that weren't really evil that they that they were, you know that they created this fake war between the humans and the others and and then there's another there's another created fake war between John and Danny or or between the Starks and the Lannisters and that everything is set against you know everybody's getting sent against each other that it's very um 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 and seven times never kill man so you know it's very harangue in minds uh if 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 you want to get very like alien about it george r, r. martin's like space stuff you know well people have been kind of annoyed because like people are asking well what the fuck was the point of it all people are really bummed that Arya was the one that killed the night king and this person was asking what's the, what's the point of brand storyline and why does it even exist in the story because he kind of <clears throat> didn't really yeah. do anything he just kind of just stood there if you think about it this other person that <laughs> sent me a message they their their thought was uh uh do you think bran wardens the ravens to get out of that awkward conversation with theon <laughs> <laughs> that was good but the, that's the real question and and, the, and the, this is the good way to put it is if the last three episodes are about the game of thrones and only the game of thrones it um it's going to be very very disappointing if the last three episodes are into the deeper question of the Song of Ice and Fire, like the deeper question of the, the uneven seasons, the time travel, the children of the forest, then we may find that there's a, there's a different big bad. And that, like the Night King dying... With three episodes left, do you honestly believe we're going to get another big bad? I don't know. I mean, uh, if it's Bran, you know... That would be interesting. The children, if it's if it's the if it's Bran through like if ch the children of the forest have taken over Bran's body and it's not Bran anymore, like then then yeah that would be that would be something. Well, I'm I'm not even expecting Bran to be like in Westeros towards the end because I do remember the last time John saw Bran back in uh, season one episode two he gives him a kiss on the forehead and says you know when you're awake I'll take you beyond the wall if you're not afraid i think that's where they're going to end it with bran bran's going to go to the cave of three eye raven stay there blah 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 blah, blah and continue right. to accumulate all the all these memories and so on and so forth um but it's it's really hard to answer that like what was the point of bran's storyline right and, and maybe maybe this is be, me being like too hopeful you know you, people are going to be like oh sweet summer child preston still thinks that there's a good ending coming like I, I don't know like i feel like there still has to be time travel I feel like there still has to be like some explanation of that. Somebody in Which your comment section said the best thing. Remember, so after the Red Wedding hit, uh, Peter Dinklage, I think, tweeted out, if you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. So, right. Someone, I mean, someone, it, someone it, in it, your it, comment section commented, if you think this has a happy ending, then you're probably right. <laughs> you're probably right. And that, yeah, so that's the thing is, if, if it is just, if the, if the last big bad is Cersei and, and, and that's it, or there, or there's a civil war between John and Danny with no deeper explanation. Then yeah, the the whole thing is gonna end shitty because we had we had our climax. John doesn't want to doesn't want to rule. He doesn't care about it. Like he's gonna tell. That's that's what's gonna happen. He doesn't care about it. I would be fucking surprised if he came out of nowhere and said, "No, it's my destiny." You know, stand aside and have a whole thing because Rhaegal is confirmed to be alive. Like in the preview. I yeah, thought yeah. Rhaegal was dead because he yeah, had a stomach Yeah, me too. And so I thought Ghost was dead. I thought Ghost was dead. Ghost, no. Ghost is alive so, as well. Alive. Someone said they saw Alice Karstark in the preview. I was like, you did? I didn't, but... Okay. Well, I guess she's... I don't know what, she, what happened to her. I have no idea maybe, either, but maybe... Maybe, maybe, maybe she, she she swapped places with, with, uh, with Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> that was so... So so, can, so we're in agreement that Arya killing Night King was dumb. It should have been someone else. Uh... I do think it's dumb, even though it's a like. That's the thing is, that it's something George R. R. Martin would do. You're conflicted on it. Well, no, no, no. Just because George R. R. Martin does something doesn't mean I necessarily like it. George R. R. Martin does a lot of things that 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 I think are stupid. I think Arya killing the Night King is very George R. R. Martin. I still didn't like it mm. um, because I think, especially, I'm not the hugest fan of book Arya, and I'm definitely not a fan of show Arya. But. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think he likes the, her character a lot more than I do. You know, like it's kind of like George R. R. Martin doesn't like doesn't like Theon as a character, hmm. but uh, but I love Theon as a character, and he doesn't understand people that like Theon. And I'm like, huh? But you wrote this character, and he's so brilliant. You know, like he's and I I mean brilliant in the sense that like he really gets to like 
human insecurity and like he does he's real you know like he's so real in that sense the article i did send you was from usa today um that says theon does not deserve forgiveness or redemption because he is a horrible person they say this because brand's last words to theon were you're a good man is theon a good man i i would i would want to argue that theon is kind of a Theon is probably one of the most realistic characters on the show because him betraying Rob was really all about him trying to find out who he really is, not who he thought he was. Theon, Theon, Theon is a man who feels a lot of guilt, but is he a good man? I mean, he's a mixture. I think he, I think he's par for the course. He's probably the I most human I, character on the show. Yeah, and that's the thing is he's Theon. Theon, and th- this is. Like why I like Theon as a character is, is is he's the most real character. He's the most he's the most relatable because because he he has dark thoughts and he has good thoughts and he has you know like everybody's mind is much darker than the than the person we 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 put out there to the world and you know we're inside Theon's head in the book and we we see those thoughts and we're like oh God you know that that's a real human being while like Jon Snow is is he doesn't have those dark thoughts. Um, and so he's not, he's a little more cardboard. Um, yeah. So, you know, in, in that sense, the, you know, you connect with Theon, but, um, but George R. R. Martin, you know, very much thinks, you know, that he, he's supposed to be a somewhat of a villain and, and he's supposed to be, you know, pathetic and he feels a lot of guilt, but doesn't necessarily, you know, push him to the correct action. You're supposed to pity him. You're supposed to relate to him, mm. but it doesn't necessarily like mean he's great. Um, uh, if you ever read Fever Dream, which is a, a book by George R. R. Martin, the, the, the chapters go back and forth between our protagonist, Abner Marsh, who's, who's a stand-in for George R. R. Martin. He's this, you know, big, fat, uh, Midwestern man, um, and a sour Billy, who is this racist, uh, jealous, like, pathetic, like, character. But at the same time, like you read the character, like as you go through the book, like Sour, Sour Billy is so much more real than Abner Marsh that, you know, by the end, you really pity Sour Billy because, you know, even though he's, he's, he's not a good person, but he's a more relatable person, mm. which is a weird thing, right? You know, like why vil- like villains are more real than heroes, I guess. Maybe we're all because we're all, you know, maybe we all have a little bit of villain in us. You know, so I think that's the thing with Theon. So Theon, it's tough. Like the the article is not fair to Theon. Um, Theon killed those two boys. Yes, that's horrible. Theon betrayed his best friend Rob. That's horrible. Um, Theon jumped in the ocean because Euron had a blade to to Yara's throat. Nah, who who, who cares? <laughs> you know, like what does he got to do? Charge and then have. Yara's throat slit, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, Theon's bad because he killed those two boys, like, and 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 you know, he he suffered a lot for it, and so there's some redemption. I don't think he's completely redeemed. I don't think he can be completely redeemed, but you know, he he tried. He, well, he gets there. I I do. Someone asked me like like, isn't it real on Twitter? Isn't it real? On- isn't it so unrealistic how Sansa is able to forgive Theon for everything he's done? I don't know. I think that speaks highly of the character to forgive this one guy for doing these awful things, but at the same time, be there when he really, when she really needed him. Like Theon did do some awful things to try and impress the wrong people. How many of us can, ha- haven't done that, right? Like we've all done right, stupid right. things to like impress people and to try and like you know live up to family expectations. Theon betrayed Rob because. He finally got back to the Iron Island after all this time, and he finds out that his father thinks of him as, like, a bitch. And he wants yeah. to impress his father. Everybody has daddy issues in Thrones, right? And Theon yeah. has probably the most, you know, arguably the most, you know, major issue with that. So I can understand him betraying everything he believes in to impress his family, to impress his father. Because we all need that, especially boys, we all need that one father figure in our lives um, to really show us the ropes. And Theon is is even more so confused because who is that person? Ned Stark? But he was Ned Stark's hostage. He even says it to Maester yeah. Lewin in episode... Uh, fuck, I forgot the episode. Yeah, my, 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 favorite, my favorite show only scene. Right. Yes. And he even says it like, you know, you know how, how he feels. So everybody's saying how lucky you are to be Ned Stark's hostage. Because that's really what he was. Ned Stark's hostage. So John, even Jon Snow can't relate to this point because at least Jon is half a Stark. 
Theon is yeah. not a Stark at all. So it's it's this it's this really weird because I, I kind of want to make a video on the whole forgiveness in, in, in regards to Game of Thrones because Sansa forgiving Theon, he he did a lot of things that he didn't have to do, and he's made up for a lot of things. And she's not stupid; she can tell that he right. he he he's he's looking for that redemption and he's trying to be but a better that, I person. Mean, I guess that's that's what makes Theon the best character in the entire story in, in, in the sense that, you know, he can never make up for his past crimes just like none of us can make up for our yeah. past crimes. Like, we, like all of us feel guilty about some stuff and we're never going to not feel guilty about mm. it. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's Theon, you know, Theon, Theon, Theon is the most human you know, he is the human heart, you know, he is the, the human heart and conflict that, that George R. R. Martin um, is trying to write about. He's, he's the best chapters. Um, I mean, may, well, maybe, maybe Aaron has the best chapters, but, but there's only, two, there's only a few of them. <laughs> but the, uh, but Theon, Theon's chapters are the best. They're certainly the best chapters in A Dance with Dragons. And um, they're, the most, they're the most tense one, though. Like, they're, they're really yeah. fucking tense. Because you know what happens. The, like, it, all, it does seem like everybody in the North wants a piece of Theon at this point. That's yeah, why it's so, it's but, so like, ugh. Yeah, and, you know, it's an interesting question about, like, you feel guilty about stuff and you try to suffer in order to make up for it. But it never seems to, no, never seems to work. You just it, does, it doesn't seem guilty, to be enough. Right? <laughs> right. And, that's, and that's the story of Theon, and that's the human story. Um, which is why Theon, you know, you connect with Theon so much. But. Preston, we've been going on for an hour. Is there anything else you want to say about this episode? Like I said, I... Oh, I mean, I, we could talk forever <laughs> about this one, because this one, there's there's so many things to talk about. We, You know, we didn't even have very much dead time. Um, I feel bad for, but, for the, the showrunners, in a sense, because every time they try to do their own thing that wasn't in the books, White Retrieval Mission, Battle of Winterfell, um... What was battle? Battle of Bastards, I think, is so far the only show original like major battle, major instance, major event that I think they hit the mark on the head perfectly. But the White Retrieval Mission, that episode, Heart, um, not Hard Home, it, uh, the Heart Beyond uh, uh, Beyond the Wall, beyond the yeah. Wall, yeah. Everybody hated the fuck out of that episode because the logistics were just so awful. This one. I mean, you can't really argue against the fact that it was too dark, shaky cam everywhere, the ending kind of blew dick. I mean. It really, like I said, I enjoyed it all three times that I watched it. I enjoyed it for what it was. There were issues with it. I didn't like Lyanna Mormont killing the, like, that was kind of silly. No, that was stupid. That was silly. Yeah. Um, Arya. Some weird, some weird fan service. Yeah, it is. And they even admit it, like, it, they like the Lyanna actress. Um, Arya killing Night King. I don't know. I just find it very, I'm, I wasn't a fan. But that aside, I did enjoy the episode for what it was. Altogether, though, will I enjoy the episode doing a full season review when we come back and on the Thrones podcast yeah. and talk about the whole season, I'll probably have a less than stellar opinion on yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess in retrospect, um, the surprise of the episode was Melisandre appearing, and I think Melisandre carried the episode. I yeah. I wouldn't go that far, but I don't know who else. Would I mean, have didn't she? It. Didn't she have the te- like? Even though the lighting of the t- the trench didn't lead to anything, wasn't it like the tensest scene? Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and and like it had, it, you know, and um. I, Hardly anybody talked in the episode, so it's tough to, to like, analyze right. what was, you know. So I want to say know. Melisandre and John's second half, as soon as he falls off Rhaegal, that was some good stuff. Even even the, the stuff with Theon, that was some good stuff. Yeah, the dragon battles were horrible. Anyway, we've been going forever, so let's, uh, yeah, let's wrap Guys, it up. Guys, uh... thank you so much for joining us. Once again, leave your thoughts down below. We might cover them in the next episode. We're on SoundCloud and iTunes. Check us out there. Preston, thank you for joining me, as always. You finally got your review out faster this time sweet you worked overtime for this <laughs> worked overtime i mean it came out you know late, can, can but, we expect yeah. the same uh overtime uh speediness for episode four i don't know man i don't know we shall see we shall guys, see guys thanks so much for joining us once again and we'll see you all next time have a good one